Welcome everyone to the second episode of InvestStream US India. I'm Pankaj. And I'm RG. So uh, before we start, I want to give you a standard disclaimer. Nothing that we're discussing is meant to be investment advice. You should speak to your tax attorney, your accountant, uh, and your investment advisor for any sort of investment advice or tax advice or legal advice. Not us, definitely. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the Reserve Bank of India's head uh, leaving the organization and the new replacement coming in, as well as what's going on in the markets and what we can expect from the Indian economy. Uh, and then we'll jump into some uh, venture deals that have been taking place. And uh, so with that, you know, let's kick it off, Harjit. We saw the Indian rupee depreciate against the U.S. dollar uh, this week and close Friday at 71.89 compared to 70.50. Uh, last week down about 1.97%. I, I guess after uh, the news about Rajit Patel leaving, uh, the rupee dropped uh, a good amount. A absolutely, because obviously th there has been, you know, uh, the administration and the RBI has been a little concerned about what's going on with the NPAs and, and governments putting more restriction on weaker bank banks not to lend money. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, they're worried about the financial health of the banks and next being next year being election year, yeah. the administration doesn't want those type of restrictions. Yeah. So, you know, with the head of the RBI resigning this week, uh, there's been a lot of chatter about the politicization of central banks and kind of what that could mean. With his resignation and the uh, appointment of Shanti Kanta Das uh, virtually the next day, um, you know, what do you think this means for the rupee and the Indian economy? Uh, and is it really going to have any sort of impact or is it going to be more business as usual? So that's always going to be the case in growing economy uh, where administrations usually do not agree with the central banks on raising rates, monetary policy changes, etc. In case of Rajit Patel, it's a bit different. India is on a third gov governor in three years, Raghuram Rajan, who's a rock star. Now he's in Chicago, and then obviously Mr. Patel coming in and taking and doing a very good job uh, following his policy. And then now uh, Mr. Das, obviously Mr. Das is not an economist. So I think the market is feeling, feeling as, as we see the rupee slid down to all, almost 70 to 80 yeah. earlier, but then it recovered. And on top of that, India has been battling NPS for the last five years. Um, Reserve Bank of India has been tackling these issues and has implemented several strategies which did not sell, uh, sit well with the current regime. So, uh, sorry to interrupt you there for a second, but with these non-performing assets, how, how is the RBI really getting involved in some of this stuff? So, so what they're saying is, as I said earlier, it's the financial health of these ban banks. Yeah. What are their lending criteria? They're trying to clean up this mess. Look, you can't lend on these criteria or they're not letting them lend above their certain ratios. So is it is it similar to the stress test that the Federal Reserve puts on U.S. banks? So banks. similar S cycles? Very similar uh, to the stress test. Gotcha. gotcha. Remember, Mr. Rajan is, is obviously a rock star from the yeah. U.S. Yeah, 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 and yeah. he's trying to implement those strategies in India. Yep. And then his uh, protege is Mr. Patel, who yep. is trying to do the same thing. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Um, okay. But... But what I, I see, see India's sovereign rating is triple B with a stable book according to Fitch. Um, but Fitch, down, uh, Fitch downwards, India's growth to 7.2% from 7.8% uh, for the current fiscal year. On Tuesday, the government appointed former economic affairs, Mr. Das, like you appointed, but he was the same person who was involved with India's uh, demonetization, demonetization yeah. which did not sell, sit well even from, you know, Mr. Forbes, yeah. he was pretty vocal about that. This is uh, kind of dehumanizing yeah. and, you know, risking one's uh, economy. Yeah. With the departure of Mr. Patel, he will continue to fall as finance ministries interference with the Reserve Bank of India. I think this will continue to play because Mr. Das worked for the regime in the past. Like we so said. are we uh, looking at uh, 80 rupees to the dollar? Are we looking at 65 rupees to the dollar? I, I, I think I think the rupee will, as it's election year, I think the rupee will continue to slide. I think this we're going to see rupee hitting 80. Uh, I, USD to rupee will hit 80. Interesting. Interesting. Or higher. When you were talking about the yield curve uh, inversions. It seems like 
you know, for the most part, the inversion is taking place 18 to 24 months before a recession hits. What do you think is going to happen after the current inversion? I mean, we're 10 years into this bull run, um, and you know, historical data seems to suggest that there's some sort of financial correction every 10 years or so, and we're well into that 10-year mark now. But we, we already, we're already starting to see the signals, right? The treasury yield curve will invert next year, uh, possibly within the next six months, uh, much earlier than forecast, uh, just three months ago, with the recession to follow as soon as a year after that. These expectations come, as we've seen earlier, uh, earlier a couple of weeks ago, that global sell-off uh, of stocks, right? Secondly, the flattening of the U.S. yield curve, longer duration bonds yield, and shorter duration uh, narrowing to smallest in decade. But I think, see, just because they are flipping, it does not really mean, it does not signal there's going to be a recession three months, six months. There's no signal uh, yeah. of that. Second, uh, I, I think uh, there has been an inversions in the past that didn't lead to recession. And it doesn't really tell you how long this recession is going sure. to last. Sure, sure. And I, I think these, and we're going to, according to uh, Elvin G. Groot, who's an economist and a strategist with Rabobank, he said we're going to experience or will get closer to yield inversion by the middle of next year or maybe even a little bit earlier. So is it fair to say that uh, some really smart people out there are expecting a recession in 2020? So I think a, a lot of smart people are expecting uh, that there will be a recession in 2020. Some sort of slowdown. Some we don't sort know of how, slowdown. How, how long or how deep, but people and, are starting to expect that. And we are, and obviously news coming out of China, right? It's a global, global uh, slowdown of global economy, not even the U.S. economy. Well, China, China's been kind of in that uh, slowdown phase for quite some time. Uh, before we get into the VC news, I just wanted to get into, uh, I don't know, about Robinhood. They yeah. said if you open up a checking and a saving account, they would offer a 3% uh, return. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of that? It's a trading app. Uh, something so I, now they're getting into banking. Something I, I didn't even know about uh, Robinhood, let's say, a month ago, but oh, today, right. until right. I've been following them, and yeah. all of a sudden, boom, yeah. 3% uh, for your checking or cash, uh, yeah. checking and savings account. What do you think of that? Robinhood has done very well with millennials, and they've built a strong user base amongst that community. Now, to start offering checking and banking services on top of that uh, makes a lot of sense, right? You, know, you, can, you can write checks, you can save your money, you can invest your money all through one app, right? Um, it's beautiful. And 3%, you know, I, I don't know any bank that's paying me 3% in, in the U.S. Treasuries aren't even paying 3%. But, but I would say still the concern, as, as I was listening to the SIPC chairman, that FD, FDIC insurance, yeah. it's not protect you. $250,000, uh, that insurance that FDIC uh, provides if the bank yeah. defaults, right? That's the minimum guarantee, so to speak. Uh, Robinhood doesn't have that. So Most of the banking apps that I've used are awful. They're terrible. <laughs> right? Have you used Robinhood? I have not. I okay. have not. Um, I don't do uh, a whole lot of trading, so I, I haven't really used Robinhood. So I do use E-Trade. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't know what Robinhood's platform looks, but I think this was a great uh, news. Investors can get more money, yeah. uh, more back for the buck. But at the end of the, uh, the regulation, we have to see how this plays out. I the next couple. Of I months. did look at the product some time ago, and just the app itself. It's a really nice app. You can tell that this wasn't designed by, you know, a large corporate bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they're, 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 they're great product people at Robinhood. So, you know, I, I, I would be open to opening an, an account over there. See, 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 see what, what's interesting to me is being user-friendly, right? Yeah. You don't have to guess. Like in the corporate banking world, you have to guess where everything is, right? And then yeah. it's not there. But in, in, in these type of, I think, uh, apps, uh, it's, it's user-friendly. What, you, what is going on in the VC world? In India, uh, Google made another acquisition this week. Uh, they bought Where Is My Train, which kind of reminds me of the Aston Kutcher movie, uh, Dude, Where Is My Car? <laughs> um, you know, apparently, they bought the company for somewhere between 30 and $40 million. The actual amount wasn't disclosed, but that's the rumored amount. Um, so what, uh, Where Is My Train, what, what they do is they collect information about trains across India, 
they aggregate that information and make it available to people through their mobile phones, through SMSs, uh, uh, and their app. I, I don't remember exactly how many times it's been downloaded, but I, if I remember correctly, it was around 10 million uh, downloads of their app across the country. Um, and you know, this is a vast amount of data for Google to get access to. Google, uh, a couple of years ago, also signed a deal with the Indian Railways to actually Wi-Fi enable the stations across India, right? So uh, this ties in with that whole strategy of just using train stations where over 20 million people travel on a daily basis across 7,000 different stations. Uh, people are, uh, it's an on-ramp for them, right? Not just uh, to get across the country, but to get information. And especially with mobile phones now, uh, Android phones, which is by far the largest uh, market in India, um, everyone has an Android phone. You know, if you're taking the train, you latch on to Google Wi-Fi, and boom, you know, you get access to YouTube and everything else that you you want access to. So I think it's a great move. the The other thing that I found really interesting about the acquisition was that the app is. Uh, vernacular. They focus on seven different local Indian languages, including Marathi, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil, um, Hindi, uh, Bengali. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed any, but um, so it, you can get the information in local language. You don't have to do everything in English, which is a huge thing. Um, you know, and the fact that a business like this is uh, being acquired for 30 to 40 million dollars, which you know by U.S. venture numbers isn't a huge amount, but by Indian standards, it's a very good exit. Um, yeah, sorry, you were. So si similar, similar. I was going to jump in. So similar to acquisition by ESPN acquired Crick Info. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah, it was, that, uh, was, that was like eight, ten years ago. Ten. But what a great transaction, yeah, right? Yeah, in terms yeah. of numbers. Yeah. Uh, that, that, uh, that's great. How many people tra travel by trains in India? There's over 20 million people a day that travel on Indian railways uh, across uh, over 7,000 stations across the country. So now for a New Yorker, that's not a lot, you know, because you've got more than 8 million people taking the subways on a daily basis just in one city. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about... Uh, a very large country, you know, maybe a third of the size of the United States, uh, with 7,000 stations and 20 million people traveling all across uh, this fairly vast network of uh, trains. Um, you know, and it's all over the country. These are not people that are commuting just for their daily jobs. These are people that are traveling constantly. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a large number. No, no, look, at the end of the transportation is a gigantic industry in India. So, um, in another uh, interesting deal, the education company Baiju's uh, is in the process of raising $400 million, uh, pushing their valuation up to $3.6 billion. Um, you know, the, apparently, and this is a rumor, the round is being led by Naspers, uh, who's been extremely active in India for the last couple of years. Uh, what's also interesting is the Canadian pension fund, CPPIB, and General Atlantic are also rumored to be participating in, in this round. Yeah, 400 million. Um, you know, the company's been growing phenomenally. It's been growing at 100% annually, uh, according to some figures, and they're targeting a $200 million revenue uh, by April of 2019. Um, you know, if they can come close to those targets, it would show that you know, education is a massive business in India. There have been a lot of people that have been talking about education uh, for years in India. I've invested in a couple of education companies in the past also. Um, but it's always been like, all right, you know, yes, we know Indians will pay for education. How much, we don't know exactly. But there's all kinds of needs around education. Um, but, you know, we haven't seen a company that's really taken off like this uh, until Baiju's. But obviously, uh, see, I, I looked at their platform, right? And, uh, and I, I'm kind of leaning towards, in, for a country like India, which has 1.3 billion people, and then obviously I looked at their platform, they offering second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, completely online. Yeah. But do, and obviously, as we further see in this country, more and more companies are hiring Obviously, you don't even go to college. They're like, no. we'll hire you as long as you have the skill set. Do you think these institutions are going to disappear? You mean universities and Universities, and even, even schools. If a if company like Baiju is offering what you get in a school and you're able to educate yourself at home, 
do you really need to go to school or college? So, I, you know, I think there's going to be a place for both. I don't think that colleges or schools or universities are going to go away. Uh, there's an important aspect to all of these uh, institutions, which is the social aspect, right? Um, it's incredibly important for a child's development to be amongst other children, to, uh, to interact with adults and children. So I think, you know, having that social experience is really important. Uh, getting outside and playing during recess is also really important. <laughs> Right? If, if people are working from home all the time, people are, are you know, sitting on their iPads and uh, kids are you know, just screen time all the time, I don't think that's going to be a good thing. And I think we're going to continue to see institutions thrive. Now, I think there's a segment of institutions that will wind up shutting down. Those are you know, generally going to be low-quality institutions, low-quality uh, education, you know, that's probably going to go by the wayside because over time you're going to have, you know, more Khan Academies, Baijus, and things like that where you can get high quality content available to you relatively inexpensively. Um, so I think there's going to be a place, but I think you're going to start seeing the low end of the market uh, eventually get obliterated and go pure digital, and you're going to start seeing the middle and Top tier markets still, you know, continue to exist because you know people that go to Harvard to do an MBA, they don't necessarily go there only for the education. They go there for the networks that they build and the people that they meet. And you know, 15, 20 years later, who are you networking with and who are you doing business with? It's those people that you went to college and uh, uh, grad school with. So I think those pieces will remain. Those are going to be more and more important over time. I think. So the next deal that which uh, I wanted to talk about again in India was uh, a B2B, B2B ag tech uh, logistics business called Ninja Cart. They run a logistics network that allows farmers to sell fresh produce directly to supermarkets, retailers, and restaurants. Uh, they have roughly 3,000 farmers and 4,000 retailers on their platform. And that was enough for them to raise a $35 million Series B led by uh, Excel Partners and Syngenta uh, based out of Switzerland. Um, this is one of the largest Series Bs I've seen in India in a very long time. Uh, yeah, I'm having trouble even remembering uh, what the last uh, Series B that came close to this mark was. Um, most Series Bs in India that I've seen in the last couple of years have been in the 10 to $20 million range. Um, you know, they have a great business model. The Indian market is, if you look at it, it's controlled by brokers. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. From farmers, it goes to like a like a market where you bid for 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 the food or yeah. the crops, and then it goes to another market. You, you put it put it in your truck. It goes to another yeah. market. And then another market. By the time the consumer gets to enjoy the food, half the food is rotten. Half the food is rotten, and you've had about eight or ten different uh, middlemen that have taken their cut along the way. And this is, reminds me of Walmart of 10 years ago when they were, they wanted to create one single platform. Yeah. And obviously, they had to exit, and now they bought flip cards, and they will just do that. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the value for a business like Ninja Card is exactly what you said. It's eliminating those uh, middlemen. It's bringing efficiency. And... Uh, Part of it is also food safety, right? Like, you know, the amount of um, additives and things that go into food in, in India is extremely high. And if you have a business that is, you know, buying at the source and managing the whole supply chain all across the way and delivering it right to the retailer or the supermarket or the restaurant, you know, there's a lot of uh, comfort that you can derive if you trust this business, right? So... You know, not to mention over time, you you should see the price of some of these uh, vegetables and fruits drop as well. Um, but mo most importantly, sorry to interject, is you see India news coming out of India how many farmers commit suicide because they they don't get banned for the buck. Yeah, yeah. The, most of the commissions get taken by the middlemen. Yeah. But I think a company like Ninja Cart. Is coming. I would love to know more about the founders. Yeah. What is their background? But they, I think, uh, some of the profit that was shared by the middlemen, it will go to these hardworking people. Absolutely. At the end of the day, it's not easy to grow crops in India, right? Yeah. It's not easy to grow crops in India. It's very difficult to transport those crops, uh, and it's even harder to get paid, 
right? Like, you know, there, all these things tie together. The, you know, most of this, these uh, transactions are still done in cash. They're not done digitally or a check. They're, they're done in cash. And, you know, somebody's got to transport the cash, right? So there's all of these factors involved, and it makes it very difficult for farmers to uh, earn decent livings in India. Um, so hopefully businesses like Ninja Cart uh, can provide services that uh, make it more efficient and make it more profitable for farmers as well. Totally agree. You know, I think a couple of years ago, I, I had written a blog post um, about uh, some of the things that I thought would be the most compelling solutions for India. And it wasn't, you know, uh, the blog post was titled, Face Building Facebook for India is not interesting or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. But the whole point was like, you know, a country like India, uh, it's great for founders to go out and say, hey, I'm going to build the next e-commerce company or the next uh, social media company that's going to compete with Google or Twitter or whomever. But there's so many problems that are staring people right in the face. The best entrepreneurs are going to make a difference by going out and solving those day-to-day -day problems that most Indians face on a daily basis. And, you know, things like Ninja Cart are doing that. And I think that's, that's where the big value is really going to come. Hence, uh, you know, $35 million Series B. And that's an opportunity because the space is wide open. Yeah. The, space is the next deal that I want to talk about really briefly, I just want to congratulate uh, two founders that I know very well, uh, Vamshi and Ayan. They're the co-founders of Siftery. Uh, Siftery was able to determine uh, what software was being used within an organization, uh, but more importantly, how, how much of it was being used. So one of the things that they could do is tell a business manager uh, that that site license that they bought for some piece of software was only being used by 20% of the business, so it was more cost effective for them to move towards a uh, per seat license, right? Um, so they were able to tell business managers how to how to do that, and you know they have partnerships and all. They started the company, I want to say, in 2012. Uh, I invested in the company in 2013. Uh, it was kind of a you had to invested in this venture, yeah. Um, not personally, but uh, the, the previous fund I was with, and uh, it was a, a Shark Tank like a, a event that we were at, and it was completely unplanned. Uh, you know, Vamshi came, he pitched at the event, and uh, you know, I liked what he was doing at that time. It was, the product was called Credi at that time, uh, and then they renamed it to Siftery. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I invested in the company. Uh, on stage, you know, on the spot, made them an offer, and you know they accepted it. And yeah, uh, so I'm really happy to see that they've uh, exited. They sold the company to G2 Crowd, uh, which is also a B2B software company. Um, the amount wasn't disclosed, uh, but you know it was. Uh, it's great to see you know another uh, great group of founders exit successfully. And congratulations. Was, yeah. Moving into another and level. And congratulations to you as well. Thank you. I want to shift gears into back to vernacular. We talked about vernacular content uh, briefly when we were talking about uh, where's my train. But you know, vernacular content in India has been making the rounds at conferences, strategy meetings amongst VCs, uh, corporate uh, boardrooms for, for years. And with the huge bump, uh, that Reliance Geo has given to mobile internet adoption across the country, it's no surprise to me that Tiger Global and Bertelsmann just pumped $10 million into Roposo. Um, they raised a Series C, and Tiger and Bertelsmann led that round. Uh, the company provides a local language video content platform for creating and sharing video. Um, I don't remember how many uh, languages they support, but it's video, so you should be able to create video in any language you want and, uh, and share it. They claim to have 25 million subscribers, uh, which is quite large. Um, what's even more impressive is they're showing 150 million video views per day. 150 million? Yep, per day. Um, and what's even more impressive is that the they got into this uh, 18 months ago. Um, you know, so it'll be interesting to see how they compete with platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, which provide wider distribution networks. Uh, 
but they don't necessarily provide the video editing tools and local language support that Reposo does. But uh, you know, it'll be, it'll be exciting to see what Reposo continues to do in that space. It looks like they have two great investors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, so in some U.S. venture news, uh, Drizzly, the Uber for alcohol uh, company, just raised a thirty-four and a half million Series C. Drizzly for alcohol? Yeah, it's, it's Drizzly. So you know, you're home, you're watching the game, you got a couple of friends over, and you run out of beer, you can pop open the Drizzly app and have alcohol delivered right to you. Really? Yep. Uh, so there's a couple of other companies that do the same thing. Um, you know, Drizzly is a Boston company. There's a company here in New York uh, that does the same thing. I don't know how many markets Drizzly is in, but uh, they, they started out of Boston. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what the total addressable market size for this space is, but I'd love to see those numbers if somebody's got them. I think everybody in the United States drink, let's say. Yeah, Absolutely, and e even for people that don't drink, you know, a lot of times they will entertain, and you know, they suddenly it's like, oh, we we ran out, and somebody's got to make a run to go pick up some more. Now this makes it really easy; just have it delivered, right? Especially for cities like, especially for metropolitan areas, yep. you don't want to go out, you don't want to take a cab, you don't want to go to the liquor store and get uh, got a liquor. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great concept. It's a great concept. It's been around for many years now. Uh, you know, my my biggest question about the space is I don't see a whole lot of differentiation from one competitor to the next, right? And, you know, I, I, I frankly, I haven't been following the space very, very closely, but, you know, I, I wonder whether it's a winner-take-all market uh, or it's just going to be an extremely fragmented market where you're just going to have many smaller companies start their own app and it's going to be almost hyper-local, right? Uh, where you got this app in this area of New Jersey, but if you go to you know Long Island or you go to you know Westbury in Long Island, you're only going to be able to use this another app. But if you go to Boston, you got to use Drizzly. Hard to tell, um, but yeah, it's an interesting model. You want no, to talk? I, about. I wanted to ask you further on bitcoins and cryptocurrency. Obviously, yeah. you saw the latest news, right? So I would like to pick your brains. What's going on in that market? Yeah. Um, there's a lot going on and there's nothing going on. Um, you know, the space is generally a disaster this year, uh, you know, at least in terms of price. The uh, price of Bitcoin has gone from a peak of t almost $20,000 down to, I think, uh, as of an hour ago, it was $3,200, um, which is a catastrophic, uh, a catastrophic drop for anybody who bought it anywhere close to $20,000. But the flip side is that, you know, in January of 2017, it was around $985. So it's still up considerably in two years. Um, but to interject, but I heard Fidelity and there was another investor yeah. who did invest into, uh, into this space earlier. Well, so F Fidelity has been investing into blockchain companies, as has NASDAQ. Uh, a couple of other companies, um, you know, we've seen a lot of these companies uh, really not bet the farm on cryptocurrencies yet, but they are beginning to see that there's tremendous value in blockchain technology. They see places where they can use blockchain technology themselves. Uh, so uh, Fidelity uh, has been kind of at the forefront uh, through their Devonshire investment uh, subsidiary. Um, they recently participated in a $4 million convertible debt round for BlockFi, which is a New York-based company. They provide uh, crypto lending, uh, okay. and uh, now they're looking at getting into institutional crypto lending, not just retail. Um, so Fidelity, they invested in a new crypto exchange with NASDAQ, recently called, uh, I think it's called Ursex, uh, E-R-S-X. Uh, I haven't used the exchange, so I don't know uh, how it is. I don't even know if it's launched yet. Um, but, you know, can we assume that the stories about Bitcoin's death uh, have been greatly exaggerated if you've got companies like NASDAQ and Fidelity continuing to put money into the space, not just, uh, you know, 
investing in blockchain technology, but investing in a cryptocurrency exchange, investing in uh, a lending platform that is lending against crypto assets. Um, but but more, what's more interesting is institutional lending, higher uh, in terms of transaction, volume, sorry. right? Yeah. Compared to retail investors, you might do the volume, but the numbers, are the small. value of the value numbers are small. Yeah. Compared to if you have institutional lending, yeah. like lending to a developer or lending to, or to an exchange, to an exchange. I think that's a that's a very interesting yeah. business model because if you have so much dollars being traded, it just further strengthens yeah. the market, but also the business market. Absolutely. You know, so you know, I think I don't think we're out of the woods yet when it comes to a recovery of cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin price. I think that's going to kind of continue at least until twenty twenty. I don't I don't see a massive shift in pricing upwards for a long time. Uh, it's possible with some global turmoil that. I could be wrong. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, but um, you know I don't want to see a whole lot of global turmoil uh, pump up the price of Bitcoin. But you know it's possible. It, you know people talked about Bitcoin being a hedge against traditional assets and the traditional economy. Um, I, don't, I think that negative correlation is kind of diminishing now, and I think you're starting to see uh, a higher correlation between Bitcoin and traditional markets, right? You know, fixed income market, the equity market, or uh, even gold. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that correlation continues to play out over the next couple of years. But um, it has to be, you know, in terms of time frame that we can measure uh, from the market perspective. Value. Yeah, and uh, and uh, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin and blockchain. I think that they're still the uh, business model needs to be developed in this space. But hey, it's an opportunity, right? Yeah, and you know, people are developing some interesting uh, businesses around the space. And you know, people talk about it, but uh, the truth is some of the best times to build businesses are during recessions, right? So here we're talking about a micro recession in the crypto world, right? With the price of Bitcoin and Ethereum and most cryptocurrencies crashing 80 to 90%. Uh, those people that were in it purely to make money are gone. They're out of the market. Those people that were running scams, well, the SEC is chasing them down. So the people that are remaining are the people that are serious about building the next generation of technology and uh, trading platforms and uh, identity platforms, secure systems, distributed internet infrastructure. Right. So those businesses are going to continue running. And they're going to continue working on this stuff. And they've got, uh, you know, the private markets, the venture capital markets, ready to put money in. And now it's beyond the uh, VC community. You also have large institutions like Nasdaq, Fidelity, and New York Stock Exchange that are ready to pour money into interesting solutions. So I think we're, we'll continue to see the next generation of technology being built. We'll see the scams and some of that other bad stuff that was going on being eliminated. Um, so it's not a bad time to start building a blockchain business. So you're optimistic. I'm optimistic for the future, right? You know, I, I, I got into the space in 2013, not deep, but started scratching the surface in 2013. I started spending a lot more time on it in 2016 and 2017. And, uh, I've gotten a lot of my friends into it. Uh, they might hate me right now, <laughs> but, uh, I did get a couple of my friends into the space. Uh, and I, I told them from the beginning, I was like, look, this is high risk, but you got to just sit on it for three to five years, right? Let's see in three years or five years whether it's moving in the right direction or it's not. Um, and I still think, you know, 2020 to 2022 is kind of, that's going to be the important time frame for us to really see where Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and blockchain are going to go. That'll be about 15, 14, 15 years after the Bitcoin uh, network first launched. So, you know, it'll give us enough time to really see where is this going. Absolutely. Well, that's it, fellas. That's enough from Investream. See you soon. Thank you very much for joining us.